Kage-sama, the first kiss that never ends. Christmas Eve. And this is the day that people celebrate, right? Not actual, actually Christmas Day. Everyone's got something going on, except for Miyuki and Kaguya so far. Of course. Oh, it's Chico. Told you that Chico's party was the one to go to. <laughs> yes, my family also doesn't believe in waste. That's why we keep our Christmas tree until April. It's for the environment. Can't be wasteful. That's not the Christmas spirit. <laughs> at least they're in the same room. No, you're looking at this all wrong. He's just being ruled by his misery right now. She's got the right idea. Thank you, Kay. Mm. Miyuki doesn't realize how lucky he is. You know what has a really high likelihood of happening in real life? Miyuki takes this long, or the relationship doesn't cement itself into a comfortable situation for this long. Kaguya ends up with another date on Christmas Eve. <laughs> These rival parties. Non-alcoholic. You've lost me. I'm going to Shika's house. Oh, they're really excited about this non-alcoholic beverage. There's gotta be one though. There's always one. <laughs> Someone's drinking. <laughs> Who is it? Nobody invited her? The heck? <laughs> that dude is- the doctor's about to get a great-great-grandson? Whatever it was, whatever line he's up to. She's just fleeing the country. Secret Santa? Secret is so grateful. He's still not looking great. Ah, oh, that's tough. That's tough. Gifts are hard already without the added. Interesting. Interesting. A handkerchief. <laughs> it's gonna be amazing. It's gonna be amazing. Simple but nice. She had a perfect tone with that. You know why I would like a handkerchief though? Because it's small. It would be a nice memory of the person who gave it to me without it being like a cumbersome thing I had to travel with. Homemade? It's pretty great. Hope you like handkerchiefs. <laughs> Chika does not approve. Really, uh, yeah, hitting Miyuki and his insecurities. Well, be careful what you wish for. And she didn't know who that was going to. Who was it aimed for? Did they actually set it up that way? <laughs> oh no, no, but, no, but. Oh no, no, Miyuki, no, you're sending the wrong message. Wow, this Christmas party ended real early. Did they even make it to Christmas? Half moon, half exposed Kaguya. Oh, oh. Oh, she got a, oh no. Oh, that's so amazing. Oh no. <laughs> Did he get her something? No, probably not. He didn't have time. He could surprise here. Leave it to Miyuki. Wasn't ready to count him out just yet. Slammed? The moon's still half in darkness. Oh, the tragedy of it. Now Kage is there, but Miyuki is not. This present just took on so much significance all of a sudden. So much symbolic meaning. Got her. Made you look. And then he flees. Like a hero. Whoa, she just scaled that wall like it was nothing. We've had two chase scenes in these four episodes, and now it's reversed. He's on the verge of collapse. He's only making it worse. I would say that's manipulative, but I think she actually believes it. 
Oh, she's really being open now. Is this a confession? Are we confessing? Did we just lose? I don't know if she's doing this intentionally. If it is, if she is, it's terrifying. But this is very effective. Miyuki's concern for her and his protective instincts are going to take over and wash out some of this misery that he's experiencing. The self-focus. This is a real tactic that can be used for evil if done consciously and deliberately. I have this experience where I have something on my chest, you know, I have this issue that I'm going through and suddenly it's turned around on me and the, the other person, my partner, is the one in pain. <laughs> And then I, I find myself throwing my own issues out the window, which sometimes actually is a good thing. You know, sometimes I'm just being overindulgent or I'm playing a game of my own without fully realizing it until that moment. But either way, it just totally gets subverted and forgotten because there's something I have to like care about now. You know, I, I don't want to see you in pain. I think that's the effect it's going to have on Miyuki. It's also such a layup, right? I mean, you just tell her, you know, she's just like giving you the answers. <laughs> Part of the irony is that they, they both kind of fully see each other. It's understandable, right? They both, I mean, they both see each other's true selves. That's largely the attraction. Right, right. It's all sort of baked in already. And she also sees Miyuki and his weak side. She just described it. She just outlined it in that chase scene. I'm really curious what this present is. Not that it really matters. It's just an objectification or itemization of their conflict. Cup and ball. <laughs> Nailed it on our first try. No surprise there. <laughs> she was trying to tell you. <laughs> yeah, the metaphor continues with this present because it doesn't matter. The thing they think they're both hiding is kind of irrelevant. I mean, part of the tragedy and I guess also the, the glory of it is that they're both already accepted by the other to a sufficient extent. You know, they both see each other pretty clearly. They just are not accepting themselves. They don't know how to cope with their own weaknesses and they see them as larger than they are or a greater portion or percentage of their beings than they actually are. There's also this illusion that you're hiding things from people, you know, like you are, but you also aren't. It's and it's hard to know what the difference is. Everybody wears a mask, right? And so people don't have a fully accurate view of you. And also the way people see you is often largely a reflection of themselves and the way they see themselves. But that doesn't mean one's view of oneself is perfectly accurate either. One's view of oneself is also skewed by experience and perspective and events in the past and fear, anxiety about one's prospects in the in the future, etc, etc. The truth is probably somewhere in between, you know, the inside and the outside. And that's a mistake that can do a lot of damage because I think the assumption is that we are very accurate judges of ourselves. And that goes horribly wrong when it's skewed too far to the negative, where you just cannot for the life of you see your own value. Your thoughts will be given a 100% reality waiting when the fact is very likely your view of yourself is not accurate. And it's hard to find the answer, but I think one clear way to look at it or one clear thing that can be avoided is like the absolutes. Like the way that Miyuki's talking about how I'm a weak person. There's no reason to have that as an identity, you know? Like you can have weak moments. Doesn't mean you are just quintessentially a weak person. Kaguya can have moments of coldness. It doesn't mean that's the, the sum of her being, that she is just a cold person, the end. Hopefully Miyuki can see her making fun of this as what it really is. Which is relief, as opposed to teasing. It isn't exactly Watchtower Balloons, but... <laughs> well, she was saying she wanted something simple, right? She wanted a convenience for Kiss, as infuriating as that was. I mean, that's also a perfect metaphor for Miyuki and his concern. Trying to dress everything up, trying to earn her through gestures. Hey, there you go. And we get full detail this time instead of obscured by a balloon. <laughs> More graceful than the events of Kaguya sama? Impossible. He immediately face palms. That was, it was good. That was a really interesting direction to take that. It's funny because when I first saw the title for this 
movie or series or whatever, the first kiss that never ends, I thought it was going to be like just from start to finish, the exploration of their their romance. The first kiss that never ends sounds glorious, you know, like we're sealed and like bonded forever in this new romantic journey venture <laughs> for most of this these four episodes what it actually was the never ending thing was their agony about the aftermath of the kiss the drama the pain the awkwardness that never ends it was very last minute you know it's a last minute save here at the end but it does address something that i've been saying about the series for a long time that i think feels right and it's essential for their development as a partnership which is that it was so focused on the the gestures and like kind of the technicalities that they didn't actually have an honest open comfortable bond this feels very novel and unique in the sense that it's one of their most vulnerable moments. I mean, they're painting a very clear contrast, I think, in a very interesting and I think intelligent way where you had that big romantic gesture with the balloons and clock tower, which was beautiful, of course, but was sort of fantasy-ish, you know, kind of Disney compared to this grungy park. <laughs> no, you know, no ceremony, just a simple kiss. Also interesting that they, they showed the kiss as opposed to being covered by a balloon. It's a little bit more raw, more real, which comes on the heels of them actually having one of their deepest conversations and their most vulnerable conversations and taking steps towards blasting through the, the illusion building. The tragedy and also the beauty of it, as I mentioned, being the fact that it's not really about the other's perception of them as much as it is about the perception of themselves. You know, it's an individual journey as much as it is a couple journey. <laughs> I don't think that's that's it. Oh, you know, and I don't know if I can get it right now. I think what it is is they need to aim high. As she's saying, their their outlooks, their endeavors have done really amazing things for them. I just think that you got to address the the glaring issues elsewhere. Maybe it's even scary to let go of them because that's been the fuel thus far to push, you know, to push themselves. But I think it's possible to heal from their respective childhood wounds, grow up, and still continue to crush it. I don't think they're mutually exclusive. Imagine how far he can push himself if he doesn't have to deal with all this love is war business. If he just had a, like, girlfriend. Is the war over? Is the war over finally? Can we move past the, the battling? I mean, you don't have to go. Chica haters will say she did that intentionally. <laughs> of course, I think Shorty is sweet. I think she's naturally sweet. Of course. To me, I, that's central to this whole thing in this episode, these four episodes. There we go, there's the integration. You know, the whole thing. And a time skip. Well, three day time skip, but. What happened at her party? That's a whole episode I need to watch. <laughs> oh no. Oh my god. That's so great. Thought she wanted ordinary. What happened to that? They seem a lot more relaxed. Wait, wait, what the hell was that? I'm so lost about what I'm looking at. Is that Ishigami and Tsubame? I would love to have seen that arc as more than a quick cut of grainy images. Something dramatic happened. Damn, I was intimate. How far we've come since season one. Oh, wow. Official? And it was Kaguya who did it. Despite all those risks. New game? Yeah, I guess, I mean, that pretty much closes that out, right? I mean, I'd love to see the relationship, of course, but this definitely reached a place that the finale of season three did not. This actually feels like they're bonded and comfortable. I like how that narration by dad kind of covered or answered one of the, the longest running jokes of the show. You know, the, the game aspect of it, the love is war, winning and losing. It's totally subverted by Kage confessing. You know, that would have been a loss. That was a loss at the start of the show. That was the whole premise. Obviously, there's been a lot of growth since then. This fourth episode of the last quarter of the movie really cemented it as something great, I think. To me, what makes it so special is that it's, well, it's about their, their couplehood. It's about them getting together, but it's done in a way where it's really about Kaguya and Miyuki. You know, we, we were exploring both of their respective traumas. Miyuki, you know, abandonment, feeling like he has to be good enough or else people will throw him away, as his mother did or out, as he perceives his mother did. Kaguya, that she can't let anyone in because it leads to pain. She's always hurting people. She hates herself for who she perceives herself to be. Both of them kind of coming to terms with that for themselves so that they can be better for each other in their relationship. And as I said, I think many times in previous seasons, a lot of times the, the benefit of relationship or the ones that are really glue, you know, the ones that really pull you 
so that you don't feel like you're in control anymore. Contain the seeds of the very things you most need for yourself. And that's true no matter how the relationship goes. If you're open-minded, if you can think like the narration was saying. As I mentioned in episode one of this four-parter, starting Kakya, or for most of the duration of filming Kakya, I, I think, I was in probably the most intense, passionate relationship of my life, where I felt truly sucked in, and I was just head over heels crazy, would have done anything. And I ended that relationship with a very different view of myself, which at times was really painful and things I didn't want to look at, but ultimately were things I, I needed to. And just like Miyuki and Kaguya, a lot of those had to do with self-value. It's a little bit of a tightrope act because I think in, in many cases, we affix significance to people based on what they have that we feel we lack. And that can go wrong when those people are seen as a substitution or kind of a quick fix or band-aid for the actual things we really need to do and, and contend with, struggle with, come to terms with, but goes well when it serves as a mirror that gives insight into those very things so that we can have a more clear, conceptualized version of maybe a more ideal self. Other people just have this way of shining a light on what we are because you're forced to see yourself from a different perspective if you're paying attention. And if you can then not use the other person or not see the other person as a tool for fixing that in this sort of objectifying way, but rather take responsibility for those things, those demons or whatever whatever they are, and kind of self-vow that those are things to work on, regardless of the way the relationship goes, then there's real value that is brought by that, that pairing for yourself. And then the stronger you are, the more you can give back to, to other people as well. I think one aspect of really great relationships, perhaps, is when you have two people that are complementary to each other in such a way that you're both giving each other strength and it's an iterative process you know it's not just one thing you need to learn but you're kind of on parallel paths if that framework is healthy and strong enough in both people that's a journey that can last a lifetime it's funny i feel a little bit silly looking back on season three the ending of season three because i think at that time i felt mostly satisfied i think i, I did make some comments that i want to see more that there's farther they can go with their own self-acceptance and stuff but this ending was so much more satisfying so much deeper than the ending of season three that i actually find myself agreeing with kagia that the symbol was better even though that comment is so infuriating that Miyuki did all that and she wants like a convenience store. Kombini confession. I get the heart of it now. I get the root of it. It's the honesty. It's the lack of artifice. Stripping away the superficial, showing you what I want to show you, this mask, really getting to the core which is something that they both needed to deal with individually and together. So while this feels like the ending of something big, the ending of their courtship, let's call it, there's still a lot, lot I want to see. I mean, I would love to see their relationship develop, but we also got other brewing romances in this show that I need to see. They were like flashing some weird, bizarre thing about Ishigami and what looked like a hotel room. That's a story that needs to be told. There's also Ino and a variety of other characters. Maybe the new game is hinting that there's more. I really hope there is. Mm -hmm.